I'd welcome everyone to the Schuber seminar. Today, we're happy to have uh, Professor Alex Young from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign telling us about uh, new or little bit numbers. Please take it away, Alex. Um, thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you, Anders, for the invitation. It's a true honor to be here, and I'm very happy to speak to my fellow Schubert calculators. Uh, I'm going to speak about some joint project I had with uh, Shilian Gao, Gidon Arlowitz, and Nicolas Rosser. Um, I think this is a, it's a Schubert seminar, and I think Schubert will be kind of low key in this particular talk, but it, it is there. Uh, so, in order to set up uh, a little bit of a historical preamble, uh, uh, let me talk about central dogmas. Uh, the central dogma in science that I'm aware of uh, is molecular biology, uh, due originally to Francis Crick and then later restated by, by, uh, by Watson, and it's often stated as DNA makes RNA makes proteins, and this is the sort of thing that uh, Watson had stapled to his wall when he was thinking about uh, the great scientific contributions that uh, he and Crick made, and post their, their, uh, their biggest one. Uh, and I want to talk about an analogy in combinatorial representation theory. And this this is something I read out of an old paper of uh, Bernstein Zelovinsky, who credit Berezin and Gelfand. And uh, the, the trio here would be that uh, the constant partition function, that is the number of ways to, uh, uh, to generate a vector using uh, positive, uh, uh, using roots uh, with positive coefficients, uh, makes the Koska coefficients, that is, the multiplicity of a particular monomial in the Schur polynomial, uh, which therefore makes uh, the Richardson coefficient, which is how do you multiply two Schur polynomials uh, and expand the basis of Schur polynomials. Now, I'm slightly lying about what Berez and Gaffon said. In reality, they weren't talking about Koska, they were talking about weight multiplicities, and they weren't talking about the Richardson coefficients, they're talking about uh, tensor product multiplicities. And so let, let's just extend this to this blue situation where we have um, tensor product multiplicities for which LR is just the GLN case. And um, I think it's also part of the central dogma of computer representation theory that if you know something in type A, you should really do it in general type. That's kind of a, a, a sort of a general uh, process by which someone thinks about these things. The purpose of this particular talk is to suggest a, um, an injection of a, another level uh, in red, the NL level, the new Littlewood numbers. And uh, it's my job in this talk later on, the second half, to explain what NL means. But I'm going to start this talk by focusing on the LR case, uh, which is to say uh, GLF. And that's where I'm going to begin. OK, I'm going to, I'm going to assume as little as possible. Uh, so reminder, uh, general linear group is the group of invertible n by n matrices uh, with complex entries. I'm interested in linear representations of a group, a GL in particular. That's just a homomorphism from GLN to uh, invertible transformations of some finite dimensional vector space. And an equivalent way to say this is you can think of your vector space as having a GLN module structure uh, given by the action of your homomorphism, uh, which is to say it's a module over the group ring of GLN. All right, main example uh, that I, at least I think tells you most of the theory in some sense. Uh, let's start with n equals two, and my vector space is going to be uh, degree two polynomials in two variables. And my action uh, is going to be changed by change of coordinates uh, in the uh, displayed way. And so what's, what's this uh, change of coordinates going to do? It, this linear change of coordinates, you're going to take a two degree two polynomial and convert to another degree two polynomial. In fact, it's a change of basis. And this change of basis is given by this three by three matrix. So the homomorphism uh, description of the representation is it takes a two by two matrix, uh, A, B, C, D, and maps you to that particular three by three matrix. And uh, it would be an exercise uh, the, to check that if ABCD has determinant non-zero, that the three by three matrix has determinant non-zero. Another uh, feature of this particular example uh, that um, I want to point out is that the entries of my three by three matrix are all uh, polynomial. Um, now, one could also talk about the possibility of the entries being rational functions, 
uh, but it's known in the theory that uh, if you understand the polynomial case in the setting that uh, the rational case uh, follows uh, easily. Uh, so we'll just talk about the polynomial case uh, for, for the sake of this conversation. Uh, you could go even further, but uh, we'll just stick with polynomial. All right, recall that a representation is irreducible if it has no uh, non-trivial submodule, if it has only trivial GLN submodules. The basic questions in combinatorial representation theory from, from when I uh, think about is you'd like to know what are the useful representations, you'd like to understand their dimensions, and in this particular setting, uh, Isaac Schur in 1901 in his PhD thesis, uh, in fact, determined the useful representations of the general linear group, and he showed that they are in bijection with uh, partitions with at most n rows. And uh, in case you've never seen partitions, uh, partitions are non-increasing uh, sequences of positive integers. And we usually draw some Young diagram associated to it. But uh, judging from the audience, I see uh, you probably already knew that. Um, one other uh, um, point that, uh, well, another point I want to make is to talk about the character of the representation. By definition, the character means that I take my homomorphism and I apply it to a generic a diagonal matrix and then compute the trace. Um, of course, if you are familiar with um, group theory of uh, finite, uh, sorry, characters of finite groups, then you might be expecting to substitute an arbitrary element uh, here rather than a diagonal matrix. But the point is, is that uh, trace is uh, invariant under conjugation. Uh, so uh, if you're diagonalizable, it's sufficient to calculate what goes on at the diagonal, uh, at the diagonalization. And then in addition, um, um, almost every matrix is diagonalizable. So by continuity, really, you see everything by computing this special case. This is, uh, if I'm assuming my representation is polynomial, uh, you know, as in, as I have here, uh, then, then uh, of course, this is going to be a polynomial, this character. But the definition doesn't really know about the way in which I label the indices. So this will also be a symmetric polynomial. Here is uh, an example from the previous page. Uh, I substitute instead of A, B, A, B C, D. Uh, I substitute X1, X2, and I end up with this particular matrix. And this is a polynomial that's symmetric in X1, X2. As you may be aware, uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, symmetric polynomials, such as the Schur polynomials, which can be defined in terms of things like semi standard tableau. But for the purpose of this conversation, we can take the definition of a Schur polynomial uh, for partition lambda to be just the character of Schur's irreducible representation associated to lambda. And in our running example, the lambda is 2, 0. OK, uh, the other thing I brought up in the preamble is tensor product. And uh, no doubt you know the tensor product, but there's one little point that I want to emphasize. So let me just make sure we go through the definition. Uh, I have two vector spaces, uh, V and W, and I want to think about their tensor product as vector spaces. Uh, and so the definition is that uh, it's, uh, you know, it posits the existence of some vector space V tensor W, which has the property that if you have a bilinear map coming out of the Cartesian product, and you have a bilinear map from your Cartesian product in the other vector space, there exists a unique linear map from the tensor product to this vector space. And if this tensor product exists, then it's unique because, uh, well, by the usual universal, you can flip U and VW, V tensor W. And uh, moreover, construction of the tensor product is no, no big deal either. Uh, you just basically create these elements V tensor W and you force uh, the map from V cross W to V tensor W to be uh, bilinear by throwing down, uh, you know, infinitely many relations. In our particular instance, uh, we're interested in V and W being GLN modules. So they are, uh, they are modules, but I want to think about their tensor product as vector spaces. And when you do that, uh, the vector space tensor product will also have an action diagonally where you take a group element and you act in this following way. And since GLN is reductive, which means that if you take a representation, you can decompose into irreducibles, when I take the tensor product of two irreducible representations, two assures irreducibles, I can write it as a direct sum of irreducibles with some multiplicity. 
uh, denoted by C lambda mu nu. How do you compute the C lambda mu nu? Well, that's uh, where characters can come in. Uh, the characters uh, are polynomials, and you can multiply polynomials, uh, the sure polynomials, and in fact, expand their basis. And uh, as it turns out, uh, product of the polynomials corresponds exactly to tensor product, and sum of the polynomials corresponds to direct sum. Therefore, answering this question is just amounts to computing, uh, you know, using polynomials. And uh, so the next thing would be, well, is there some common way to compute C lambda mu nu? But before I get into that, let me just say that um, for those who, of you who are new to this particular topic, it may seem a little bit artificial how I constructed things, because the way I made it sound is, well, you have these representations, you have this natural operational tensor product. So why don't we just take tensor product and decompose as a thing to do? But uh, when you work with the representations and you're trying to build them up, really, I mean, you would be, in fact, to, you know, taking tensor products in order to actually construct the damn things. And so really, this question is not just an artificial question for the purposes of pleasure. It's actually really the end point of, of the whole setup. All right. Uh, let me uh, speak about the literal Richardson coefficients, the LR coefficients. These C lambda mu nu are um, these tensor product multiplicities. They're known as the Littlewood Richardson coefficients. Uh, and what I'm about to do is quickly tell you how to compute it combinatorially. Uh, and for those of you who already know it, then you can just take a break. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, um, then the main point I want to get across is that uh, if I go too quickly in this particular slide, the emphasis is that you could learn this rule in 10 minutes if you had a quiet moment for yourself and i will be using it a little bit later so just logically speaking i want to tell you that there exists such a rule you can compute with it and later on um, you could deduce things that i will say from this particular page just for pedagogical reasons i want to say that all right so literation rule says it's a counting rule it says that c lambda mu nu counts the number of semi-standard young tableau t of skew shape new slash lambda with mu i many i's that are about that. Uh, example would be lambda mu nu here. So three one, uh, four two one, and two one. And the question that I want to solve is how many times does the middle guy appear in the tensor product of the outer guys? Okay, so uh, how does the rule work? You take the big guy, new, the big guy, and you take away lambda on the inside, so you forbid some parking spots. And what mu tells you is it tells you how many ones and twos you can throw into the empty spots. Uh, in this case, because there's two boxes of the first row of mu, you can put two ones, and one box of the second row, you can put a two. So therefore, uh, there are three possible fillings that you could put down uh, under, those, uh, under that weight constraint. But what's this ballot condition? The ballot condition says that when you read in traditional Chinese, which is down columns and right to left, that you always see more ones than twos as you're reading. Okay, so this uh, T1 and T2 are good, but B is bad because when you start reading traditional Chinese, you see a two before you see any one. And uh, finally, there's a semi standard condition, which is. Um, you know, about increasing rows and columns, which is actually an irrelevant condition in this particular example. So the upshot is, is that in this example, the uh, multiplicity of new in the test product of lambda mu is two because of T1 and T2, okay? And uh, if the rule's a little bit complicated, my point is not to emphasize it's complicated, is that it is so simple, given the fact that you want to do what would be seemingly a difficult operation like tensor decompose. All right, what's the main question that uh, pervades this particular talk? Uh, the question, uh, naively stated, is characterize when C lambda mu nu is positive. At first sight, the question is rather stupid because one answer could just be, well, you just told me an algorithm, so just compute the algorithm. And if, the if it comes up with the empty set, then the answer is zero. And if it doesn't, it's positive. Um, well, first of all, if you were to do that, it's rather inefficient to actually compute the things. But my point in this talk is not even to talk about uh, matters of complexity. It's irrelevant to this particular conversation. 
What I do want to show you is that this question is indeed an interesting question and moreover has interesting answers. How would you analyze this question? Well, the first thing that you can uh, find out about the Lewis and coefficients, just as sort of as a set, is uh, that they form a semigroup. That is, suppose I have lambda mu nu, a triple that produces a positive coefficient. So I'll call that LR triple. And I have another LR triple. Then when you sum the indices, you get an LR triple. So the vectors lambda mu nu concatenated, they form a semigroup. And this you can deduce from the previous slide. It's, it's, uh, it's just from knowing that, that rule and thinking hard. Okay, so with that said, let us define the LR semigroup to just simply be LR triples. And it's a semigroup from the previous statement. Now, the next one's a little bit tricky. I need to define something like, uh, we'll call it like a, a, a provisionally a defective LR semigroup. It's the saturated LR semigroup. It sounds almost exactly the same, except you have this extra existence. What's that? Here, lambda mu nu are going to be rational partitions. That means non-negative uh, decreasing uh, sequences of ra rational numbers. And you are in the saturated LR semigroup if you can rescale by a positive rational to be the LR semigroup. It's an odd definition, uh, but uh, something important to this talk. Okay, uh, fantastic theorem of Kutz and Tau says the following. It says that the LR coefficients are saturated. Uh, what this means is that LR, the LR semigroup, is are precisely the lattice points of the saturated LR semigroup. And moreover, they both generate the same rational polyhedral cone. Rational polyhedral cone means that you have some matrix, I guess, three and by three and matrix. Uh, with rational coefficients such that the convex hull of the points here and the LR semigroup and convex hull of the points here and their saturated group uh, are exactly described by these inequalities. Having stated uh, Kusentau's saturation theorem, I think it's fair to ask why did you need to bring up the second definition because in fact they're both equal. And it's, it's not actually just to make the historical point that uh, Kutz and Tao made this contribution. It's actually that uh, in, in great generality, these two things may not be equal. So it's actually, let's say, a good situation in type A that they're equal. They could be different uh, in, in, uh, in the far end of the, of the uh, central dogma. Uh, and we'd like to examine when it is and when it isn't equal. Okay, I promised you that the question of determining when a LR coefficient is positive has interesting answers. And this slide is, uh, is about that. Um, remember, a complex valued matrix is Hermitian if it's equal to its conjugate transpose. And the spectral theorem says that all uh, Hermitian matrices are diagonalizable by conjugating the unitary matrix and have real eigenvalues. The eigenvalue problem uh, that stems back to the 19th century asks the following question. Suppose I have three Hermitian matrices, A, B, and C, and I impose the condition that A plus B equals C. How does that constrain the possible eigenvalues, lambda mu nu, that can appear? So the eigenvalue, these, I'm gonna think of these as real partitions, right? Instead of rational partitions or integer partitions, right? real partitions. And here I'm actually imposing that the, the partitions, the, the eigenvalues be non-negative. And this is not actually a constraint of the theory. It's, you can consider the general case. It's just that I want to compare them to partitions. It's a little bit easier for my presentation to talk about it that way, okay? So general question is A, B, and C eigenvalues are matrices, are mission. You have A plus B equals C. What are the possible eigenvalues you can get? And let's talk about uh, the eigencone to be precisely those partitions, or sorry, real partitions, lambda mu nu, uh, which for, for which there are such matrices A, B, and C, and for which lambda mu nu are their respective eigenvalues. The eigenvalue problem was first solved by Kliachko, and one of his theorems is the following. 
His theorem says that LR sat, the defective LR semi, uh, uh, semi group, and uh, the the rather the thing that it generates say, as a rational polyhedral cone and the eigen cone are in fact the same thing. And it's a spectacular theorem because if you haven't seen these sort of things before, what would tensor product multiplicities have to do with eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices under some weird addition constraint? I, uh, of course, this is a, a, a theorem that uh, really, uh, I think it's just spectacular. And it's so spectacular that I want to share it to you uh, through an example. I want to actually see that that it really works. Uh, let's let lambda mu nu be these three partitions, uh, 4, 1, 3, 1, and 6, 3. And you can check using the littlewood richson rule that this times this has that as a, as a constituent. Therefore, you are in LR2, uh, which therefore means that you are in LR sat. And in fact, this containment is really an equality due to Knudsen and Tau. But we don't need that for the moment. What Kaliachko is saying, therefore, is that there must exist two by two Hermitian matrices with the eigenvalues 4, 1, 3, 1, and 6, 3, such that a plus b equals c. Okay, so let's try to solve for a, b, and c. Uh, let's con first of all, we can conjugate by a unitary to assume that c is diagonal with this form. And what I have on the left side here, this is an arbitrary two by two Hermitian matrix, and this this is an arbitrary matrix that's Hermitian given the fact that a plus b equals c. So what are a, little a, little b, and little c? Uh, you can use the, the Newton identities. Uh, the tr trace of a matrix is the sum of the eigenvalues. The determinant of the matrix is the product of the eigenvalues. And when you do that, and I did, <laughs> you work out that you have some two linear equations, a and c, and that you can back substitute to get uh, b. And you get a complete parametric solution in terms of argument theta this way. And when you uh, conjugate by whatever unitary you want, you'll get all possible solutions for A, B, and C. This is just to say that in the two by two case, you have complete control of the problem. You can just figure out, uh, you know, given that Kaliachko was telling you the existence of these things, what the actual solutions are. But the question Kaliachko is, is, theorem is about is how do you know which lambda mu nu give you a system of equations with a solution. And I must confess that having thought about it a little bit, it wasn't so obvious to me that I would get his answer. First of all, that there'd be linear inequalities, but uh, I would get uh, his answer even in this small case. All right, so what is his general solution? Let me make a definition uh, for a non-negative integer n. Uh, I'm gonna call the Kliachko inequalities. Uh, those of this form, where you're summing the eigenvalues, uh, subsets of the eigenvalues, uh, lambda, uh, new lambda mu, over some subsets k, i, and j. And what are k, i, and j? They're going to be subsets of n, this n, of the same size for which some smaller Lidrichson coefficient is positive. And this small the Lidrichson coefficient is defined in terms of these taus, and taus are just, you know, like when you take a subset, you draw a lattice path uh, as you teach your undergraduate combinatorics students, and that proves you a partition. Okay, so his the definition is is uh, like this: it's about knowing when something is LR sat by knowing when something is an LR. Okay, so it's not quite recursive. And his theorem, uh, of course, is that LR sat and therefore also eigen cone of, of the Hermitian matrices is exactly described by his inequalities, precisely described. Now, before Kaliachko's theorem, there was a conjecture by Horn in the 50s. And Horn's conjecture was also exactly trying to understand the eigen cone, uh, eigen n. Right now, his inequalities were exactly the same. Look, like it's the same thing that I have boxed here, except that Horn's inequalities do not talk about literature and coefficients. They have this substituted by saying, "Oh, I still have the same tau, this tau, that tau, and this third tau." But I'm going to ask whether those are eigenvalues 
of the T by T version of the Hermitian, of the Hermitian matrix problem. What Kliatchko's result combined with the earlier theorem of Knudsen and Tau says is that Horn's inequalities are true. Why? Because Kliatchko says that the eigen cone is equal to LR sat, and, and Knudsen and Tau are saying LR sat is equal to LR, and Kliatchko's inequalities are in terms of known by LR. So by a trivial induction, once you know these two theorems, uh, you've deduced Horn's inequalities. Once you know the theorems. Okay, uh, I think this is uh, a good time to pause. This is the end of the conversation about GLN, and when we come back, I'll talk about the NL situation. <laughs>